A pleasant day to everyone. For today's topic, we will be talking about the risk management and safety in the histopathology laboratory. Risk management class pertains to personal as well as environmental health and safety. And the first step in risk management is to identify all hazards in and emanating from the laboratory. Merely preparing an inventory of chemical reagents is not enough to identify hazards in histotechnology. By the way, histotechnology, this is the art and science performed to produce tissue sections. Okay, histotechnology. Electrical, mechanical, and biological hazards must also be included. Obsolete chemicals should be properly disposed of. SOPs or the standard operating procedures must be detailed to include control of hazardous substances, risk assessments, and other health and safety information relevant to handling specimens. Equipment malfunction due to poor maintenance and poor quality reagents can result in poor processing of tissues or inaccurate staining results. That is why there is a need for us to do preventive maintenance or quality control. It is everyone's responsibility to minimize risks associated with day-to-day -day activity by using safety guards and checking the quality of reagents. All the medical technologists and laboratory technicians should be knowledgeable on how to deal, use, do quality control, and preventive maintenance to each of the equipments and instruments in and out the histopathologic lab. One of the most common accidents in the laboratory involves cutting of one's finger or hand on microtome knives. As we all know, class, that a microtome is used to cut tissues into thin sections. This is around 4 to 6 micra. Imagine how sharp edged these blades are so you have to always be very careful in the histopath lab especially in using the microtome the risk manager should develop a system whereby all incidents and accidents are reported no matter how big or small this is each incident should be investigated and where possible, additional measures should be taken to ensure that the incident will not be repeated. So everything that is happening inside the laboratory must be documented. It should be also reported to the infectious officer so that there will be necessary steps that will be done, like tetanus shots, hepatitis vaccines, and so on. Speaking of instrumentation, what are the different instruments that are found in the histotechnology lab? The major pieces of equipment for any surgical pathology laboratory are the pictures on the screen class. The one on the left is what we call an autotechnicon. This is an automatic tissue processing machine which fixes, dehydrates, clears, and infiltrates tissues, thereby decreasing the time and labor needed during the processing of tissues, resulting in a more rapid diagnosis with lesser technicality. So this helps the medical technologists in the laboratory by reducing the amount of time used to uh, do fixation up until infiltration because during the old medical technologist who taught us they told us that the way they process the tissues before they have to carry a huge bucket with all the tissues inside and transfer from one container to another or a one barrel to another so they have to do that very tedious procedure every so we're very lucky to be working in the laboratories now that we have the autotechnicon. But still, if there are any technical problems during the course of your work, let's say power outage, then sometimes you have to manually transfer the receptacle basket from this area over here, from let's say basket one going to basket two.
So still, you have to learn the basics before going to the automated one. Next is the one on the right is what we call the microtome. So this is the instrument that is used to cut tissues into thin slices. As what I have said a while ago, it takes or it can produce four to six micro of um, thickness. So that means that's very thin. The picture on the left class is what we call the automated cover slipper. This is used during the mounting procedure. So you get one cover slip. On top of the slide, you apply the mounting media. This is to ensure that there will be lesser bubbles that is being introduced into your specimen and there will be no spaces left on top of it. The picture on the right class is what we call an automated H&E stainer or it's generally known as an automated slide stainer. This one reduces the fear of having an overstain or an understaining process during the application of the dyes since this one is already timed and programmed according to its number of dips. Automated slide stainers class are usually used for immunohistochemistry. And what is so amazing about this class is that it gives lesser time for the medical technologist to deal with slide staining. Sometimes when you stain slides, it takes around 15 minutes. But right now, you can do other stuff like grossing more samples, writing in logbooks, checking requisitions, rechecking labels. So the automation in the histopath lab is really of great help. Let's proceed. The picture on the left class is what we call a cryostat. This one has a built-in microtome and have a freezing chamber inside. So basically, this one is used for rapid diagnosis. So when the patient is open at the OR, specimens are sent to the laboratory. This cryostat is used to produce very fast results. So it freezes the specimens fast without producing ice crystal artifacts and without having to remove the specimen inside this freezing chamber, there is already a built-in microtome inside it. So you can cut or uh, the tissues into thin slices ready for staining and then to be read by the pathologist so that they can release results ASAP. The patient, by the way, is open at the OR, so there is a need for a rapid initial diagnosis. So when the pathologist says that the patient has a benign or a malignant carcinoma, either the surgeon removes the entire thing or leaves and just removes the part where the carcinoma has already spread. So that's how it works inside the laboratory and also in the OR. For preventive maintenance, it is imperative that the laboratory maintain a current file for every piece of equipment in the laboratory. This file should contain the following information. Name, manufacturer, model, and serial number. There should also be a record of preventive maintenance performed as prescribed by the manufacturer. There should also be a record of service calls and repairs performed, especially when the medical technologist can no longer troubleshoot this kind of equipment or the instrument. So there is a need for us, medical technologists, to call the, and ask for the help of the engineers from the manufacturer. There should also be a copy of an operating manual so that we will be guided on how to operate um, this certain machine. What do you think is the first and most important step in the operation of any piece of equipment inside the laboratory? One must always read the manual. This manual class is always accompanied together with the equipment. 
Never attempt to set up a major piece of equipment without approval from the manufacturer. Always with the help of the manufacturer's engineer or engineering team. The operating manual provides information to the machine's operation. Always learn the basics of any machine's operation before using. That is the reason why we always have a yearly training for each of the instruments that is found in the laboratory so that we will be reinforced. We can relearn what we have forgotten because sometimes when we have been doing these things over and over again, we seem to forget the very principle of the equipment or the instrument. We just do the work but forget that how or how, how the principle really works inside or how was it programmed? So those types of things. As part of orienting new employees, it is recommended that each piece of equipment has a checklist. This checklist is a step-by-step -step approach to the machine's operation. The checklist should be administered by a technologist's experience with its operation. The more precise the checklist is, the better the operator will be. The checklist prescribes the appropriate use of the equipment. The checklist also ensures that the laboratory equipment is used safely and effectively. I suppose you guys have already mastered the care and the use of the microscope. So kindly review on the parts of the microscope, its magnification and calibration, the daily care and maintenance of the microscope. So please be familiarized with it once again. This will be included in your examination. The quality of sections and quality of staining produced by the histopathology laboratory must be checked before issuing them to the pathologist. Special stains to identify particular tissue components or microorganisms must always be accompanied by parallel staining of a section from a control known to have the component under study. In the laboratories class, we do quality control every day to make sure that the machine's running ability is within acceptable range. We also check and filter the different application dyes in the laboratory just to make sure that there are no precipitates on the slide. There are no unacceptable debris that will confuse the reader or the medical technologist as well as the pathologist. So there is always QC in the laboratory every day. And make sure that the QC is within acceptable range. Very good. A set of written, standardized operating procedures are usually mandated by accrediting or regulatory agencies to ensure that the laboratory is safe. This includes detailed procedures for handling hazardous substances and personal hygiene practices, records of regulatory compliance, risk assessment, causes and prevention of occupational injury or illness, health and safety training, Personal protective equipment and hazardous waste disposal practices must be kept indefinitely. The American Society of Clinical Pathologists has established a special certification in laboratory safety for medical and histological technicians and technologists. Yearly retraining should be mandatory and documented. The first step in ensuring safety in the laboratory is to identify all hazards in and arising from the workplace. Unidentifiable, questionable, old or obsolete reagents and chemicals in poorly labeled containers should be set aside for disposal. A file of hazardous chemicals from material safety data sheets are now available from databases on the internet and should be readily accessible in the laboratory. All hazardous agents must be listed and evaluated, including normal use, disposal, and risk associated with spillage.
Health hazards include, first, biohazards. This refers to anything that can cause disease in humans, regardless of its source. Biohazards include infectious agents as well as contaminated solutions, specimens, or objects. Irritants. These are chemicals that cause reversible inflammatory effects at the site of contact with living tissue, especially in the skin, eyes, and respiratory passages. So these are reversible inflammatory effects. Corrosive chemicals cause destruction or irreversible alterations when exposed to living tissue or destroy certain inanimate surfaces like metal. A chemical may be corrosive to tissue but not to steel or vice versa. Few are corrosive to both. Sensitizers cause allergic reactions in a substantial proportion of exposed subjects, not just in hypersensitive individuals. Sensitization may occur at work because of the high exposure level. Carcinogens are substances that induce tumors not only in experimental animals but also in humans. Examples of carcinogenic chemicals include Write this down, chloroform, chromic acid, formaldehyde, nickel chloride, and potassium dichromate. Carcinogenic dyes include oramin, basic fuchsin, and any dye derived from benzidine, including Congo red and diaminobenzidine. Lastly, under health hazards, it is toxic materials. These are capable of causing death by ingestion, skin contact, or inhalation at certain specified concentrations. These include methanol, chromic acid, osmium tetroxide, and uranyl nitrate. Let's proceed to physical hazards. Number one, we have combustibles. These are substances that ignite at or above a certain temperature or what we usually call as a flash point, at which vapors will ignite in the presence of an ignition source. Combustible liquids pose little risk of fire under routine laboratory conditions, but they will burn readily during a fire. In the USA class, OSHA defines flash point as 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius while the Department of Transportation defines it as 141 degrees Fahrenheit or 60.5 degrees Celsius. So when you reach above these flash points, these certain hazards are called combustibles. It is totally the opposite when you talk about flammables. They have flash points below the temperatures specified above, but require specially designed storage rooms, cabinets, and containers to control and prevent vapors from building up around electrical devices that spark. So when you say flammables class, they ignite at a flash point below 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius, or for DOT, that's 141 degrees Fahrenheit or 60.5 degrees Celsius. When you say combustibles, that's above. Flammables, that's below flashpoints. C comes before F. So C above, F below. Another from physical hazards is the explosives. Explosive chemicals that include picric acid, Certain silver solutions may explode upon aging, which is why they should never be stored after use. So they should be discarded in proper disposal containers. Very good. Lastly, oxidizers are harmless by themselves, but may initiate or promote combustion and present a serious fire risk when in contact with certain substances. Examples of oxidizers class include sodium iodate, mercuric oxide, and chromic acid. These are some of the terms that I want you to remember. We have PEL, TLVs, and OEL. 
So for PEL, that's permissible exposure limits, which means that there is a maximum amount or concentration of a chemical that a worker may be exposed to under OSHA regulation. For time-weighted average, this is the average exposure to any hazardous chemicals or gas in the workplace based on an 8-hour workday or a 40-hour work week. It is the maximum amount one may be exposed to without experiencing significant adverse health effects. Short-term exposure limit. This is an allowable average exposure over a short period of time typically around 15 minutes, and should not be exceeded more than four times in a day as long as the TWA is not exceeded. If the predetermined limit has been exceeded, the worker must remove him or herself from the hazard for at least one hour. Threshold limit values indicates the amount an individual can have exposure to without any adverse effects. Occupational exposure limits. This is an upper limit on the acceptable concentration of a hazardous substance in the work area for a particular material. Even in specimen collection, every chemical should be labeled with certain basic information including its chemical name and if a mixture, names of all ingredients, the manufacturer's name and address if purchased commercially or name of person making the reagent, date purchased or made, expiration date if known, and hazard warnings and safety procedures. Most laboratory chemicals can be safely stored in conventional cabinets. Dangerous liquids are best stored below countertop height to minimize the risk of bodily exposure in case a bottle is dropped and broken. Dangerous reagents must be stored in plastic or plastic-coated glass bottles. Certain flammable liquids that present unusual fire and explosion risk must never be stored in a refrigerator or freezer unless these appliances are certified as suitable for an explosive atmosphere. If use of these chemicals cannot be avoided, only small quantities must be made available as needed and they must be used up completely if possible. Do not try to store any leftover flammable liquid. In handling small spills, these are defined as those that can be safely handled by the immediate staff. Spill neutralizing and containment kits should be available immediately outside the hazardous work area. This may be commercially purchased or assembled from common materials and should include protective equipment and cleanup aids such as good quality latex or nitrile gloves, similar in thickness to dishwashing gloves, disposable plastic aprons for chemical spills and disposable gowns for biohazards, dust pan and brush for powders, sponges, towels and mops for liquids, adsorbent material like kitty litter or a commercial sorbent, bleach like sodium hypochlorite for biohazards, baking soda for acids, vinegar like around 5% acetic acids for alkalis, a commercial formalin neutralizing product, a sealable plastic bucket, and heavy plastic bags for containment of the salvage waste. If the amount of spilled material is limited to a few grams or milliliters, it can be simply wiped off with towel or sponge while protecting the hands with suitable gloves. The towel or sponge must be disposed of appropriately after use. Do not put it into the general trash and protect the room from its vapors by sealing it within an impermeable plastic bag or container. For any other spills of dangerous materials, all personnel should evacuate the room or immediate vicinity where the accidental spill occurred and first aid must be given to anyone who has gotten splashed or is feeling the effects of vapors. If the spill is large, the area must be sealed off and an experienced emergency response team must be called. 
With laboratory chemicals, the most common accidents requiring first aid are ingestion, eye contact, and extensive skin contact. Laboratory technicians and technologists should have basic training in dealing with these situations, and yearly safety training should include first aid information and preparedness in the event of chemical accidents, including accidental ingestion of hazardous chemicals. Splashing of dangerous chemicals into the eyes is also a common accident. All laboratories should be equipped with emergency eye wash stations, either as a freestanding device or small appliance affixed to sink faucets. Current recommendations are to have devices no more than 100 feet from hazardous work areas, and the water temperature should be controlled to a range of 15 to 35 degrees Celsius. Portable eye wash bottles are not recommended because they hold too little liquid and may become contaminated with microorganisms. In case of accidental splashing, the affected eye should be rinsed for 15 to 30 minutes, pulling the lids away from the eyeball prior to seeking emergency health care. Handling of potentially infectious specimen Pathologists, histotechnologists, and technicians may be exposed to a certain level of risk when handling and processing potentially infectious specimen through inhalation of aerosols, contact with non-intact skin, and contact with mucous membranes such as the eyes, nose, and the mouth. Fresh tissue and body fluids must always be considered potentially infectious and grossing of specimen has the highest risk of all histological activities. Fixed specimens have a much less risk because nearly all infectious agents are deactivated by histological fixation, although tissues must be thoroughly fixed for this to happen. Complete penetration by alcohol will destroy all infectious agents except prions. Proteins decide to become a killer. Some proteins, even though extremely rare, can misfold from these really weird proteins called prions. These proteins actually misfold other properly folded proteins, causing an exponential chain reaction of misfolded proteins, and they all end up binding together. In an infected person, these proteins are located in the brain and cause neural issues and death quite quickly. These neurological disorders are known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, or TSEs for short. They are a group of the rarest diseases and have the highest mortality rate on the planet, with 100%. There are no known cures and no treatments available. TSEs are extremely scary. Prions are infectious agents that cause spongiform encephalopathies such as Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, Scrapie, and Mad Cow disease. Normal steam sterilization does not inactivate these particles, and common effective treatments like sodium hypochlorite or phenol will create artifacts in tissue. Tissue from patients with suspected Creutzfeldt Jakob disease or CJD can be decontaminated by immersing the specimen in formalin for 48 hours, followed by treatment in concentrated formic acid for another hour, and additional formalin fixation for another 48 hours. So make sure to follow all these steps when dealing with prions. Small dust particles generated from sectioning may become airborne, particularly when performing cryostat sections of fresh tissue. Cryogenic sprays can magnify this risk and therefore should not be used to freeze potentially infectious tissue. Cutting areas or surfaces may be sterilized with chlorine, bleach, or a suitable commercial disinfectant. Hazards and handling of common histological chemicals. Most of the chemicals used in the histopath lab class can be handled safely. However, there are certain hazardous chemicals that require special attention or care in handling that should be eliminated completely after use or that should be used at the smallest quantity possible. In most instances, these histologic agents should be handled under a chemical hood. 
Acetic acid. Direct contact with concentrated acetic acid can irritate the skin, eyes, and respiratory system. A 1 to 10% dilute solution is relatively safe. Concentrated glacial acetic acid should not be mixed with chromic acid, nitric acid, or sodium potassium hydroxide. Ammonium hydroxide should be stored away from acids and should not be mixed with formaldehyde as this generates heat and toxic vapors that can be irritating to the respiratory system. Aniline is toxic when absorbed by the skin, can cause severe irritation of the eyes, and is a potential carcinogen. Excessive exposure may cause drowsiness, headache, nausea, and cyanosis. By the way, cyanosis class is a blue discoloration of the skin. Routine use of this dangerous reagent should be avoided if possible. Chloroform is a very dangerous chemical that is toxic when inhaled or ingested. It is also carcinogenic and can affect the liver, reproductive organs, central nervous system, blood, and gastrointestinal tract. Excessive exposure to the vapor can cause disorientation, loss of consciousness, and death. Its use in the laboratory should also be avoided. Chromic acid or potassium dichromate is toxic to the kidneys, is corrosive to the skin and mucous membranes, and can cause cancer. All forms of skin contact must be avoided. Any solution containing chromium, including post-fixation solutions or rinses after staining with solutions containing chromates, should not be subjected to drain disposal because this is an environment toxin. Diethyl ether is flammable, extremely volatile, and is capable of forming explosives. Ethanol is a skin and eye irritant, but is not likely to cause significant toxicity if used under standard conditions. Ether, on the other hand, may cause mild to moderate irritation of skin and eyes. It is dangerously flammable and extremely volatile. It should never be stored in a refrigerator or freezer unless these appliances are certified as suitable for an explosive atmosphere. Excessive exposure to vapor can cause disorientation, loss of consciousness, or death. Ethylene glycol, when inhaled or ingested, is toxic to reproductive, urinary and blood systems with additional exposure likely to the skin. Propylene-based glycol ethers should be used as substitute for ethylene glycol and the reagent must be handled under a fume hood with butyl gloves. Formaldehyde and paraformaldehyde are toxic by inhalation and by ingestion, and this can cause severe irritation of the skin and eyes. They are also carcinogens and are corrosive to most metals. All workers exposed to formaldehyde should be periodically monitored for exposure levels. Formaldehyde waste can be recycled by distillation or by drain disposal, can be detoxified by a commercial product, or can be disposed of by a licensed waste hauler. Formic acid can irritate the skin and eyes, and it can also corrode metal. It should be handled under a chemical fume hood. Glutaraldehyde can cause severe irritation of the eyes and skin and is toxic by ingestion. Hydrochloric acid can cause severe irritation of skin, eyes, and respiratory system and is corrosive to metals. Concentrated acid is particularly dangerous because of its fumes and should be handled under a fume hood using goggles and gloves. Hydrogen peroxide, on the other hand, is essentially harmless if used in concentrations less than 5%. Hydroxide, either sodium or potassium, is corrosive to eyes and skin. Isopentane is extremely flammable and highly volatile and should be stored only in a refrigerator or freezer that is especially suited for explosive atmosphere. Chilled isopentane can cause frostbite. Excessive exposure to vapors can cause irritation of the respiratory tract, 
cough, and irregular breathing. Accidental ingestion can cause vomiting, headache, depression, and abdominal swelling. Isopropanol can cause mild to moderate irritation of the skin and eyes and is toxic by ingestion. Mercuric chloride and mercuric oxide can cause severe irritation of the eyes and skin and are corrosive to metals because they contain mercury. Most processing solutions will be contaminated with mercury if specimen is fixed in B5, helis, or zincers fixative. This will be taught to you in fixation next week. Reagents used to dezincurize the section will release mercury and must not go through drain disposal. To avoid expensive disposal, mercuric fixatives may be replaced with zinc formalin or glyoxal solutions. Methanol class is a moderate skin and eye irritant and is toxic by ingestion and inhalation. It may cause blindness or death if taken in excessive amounts. Nitric acid is corrosive to skin, mucous membranes, and most metals. It is also toxic by inhalation. Nitrogen in liquid form can cause frostbite or thermal or, or cold burns. Excessive inhalation may cause dizziness, loss or consciousness, or death from asphyxia. Osmium tetroxide is corrosive to eyes and mucous membranes. Vapors are extremely toxic to reproductive, sensory, and respiratory systems. Osmium tetroxide vials must be scored, broken, and opened under a hood and not in open air. Oxalic acid is relatively safe when used in dilutions prescribed for histologic use. When concentrated, it is corrosive and causes severe burns of the eyes, skin, and mucous membranes. Repeated skin contact can cause dermatitis and slow healing ulcers. While periodic acid, this one is relatively safe when used in quantities prescribed for histology. Phenol is readily absorbed through the skin and may cause increased heart rate, convulsions, or death, or may burn eyes and skin. It is combustible and should be used with extreme caution under a hood, especially when mixing concentrated formaldehyde and phenol. Picric acid is explosive when dry or when combined with metal and metallic salts. Picric acid solutions, including yellow rinse fluids or processing solvents, should not be disposed by pouring down the drain since they may form explosive picrates with metal pipes. Jars and cap threads containing picric acid should always be wiped with a damp towel to prevent the substance from drying. It is toxic when absorbed through the skin and this one is also shock sensitive. Potassium ferrocyanide and potassium ferrocyanide. These are relatively safe when handled in concentrations prescribed for histologic use. Potassium permanganate, on the other hand, may cause irritation of skin and eyes. Accidental ingestion will cause severe gastrointestinal symptoms. Because it is a strong oxidant, it should not be mixed with acetic acid, ammonium hydroxide, ethanol, ethylene glycol, formaldehyde, glycerol, hydrochloric acid, hydrogen peroxide, or sulfuric acid. Propylene glycol is a less toxic substance for ethylene-based ethers. Silver salts are relatively safe when used as a fresh solution, but can be explosive when solution becomes old. It can irritate eyes and skin and can cause severe gastrointestinal discomfort if ingested. It is a serious environmental hazard and should not be discarded down the drain. Sodium azide is very toxic and may be fatal when swallowed or absorbed through the skin or when mixed with acids. It can explode when placed in contact with metals and should not be discarded down the drain because the buildup salts can also cause explosion. Sodium bisulfate is relatively safe when used in dilute solutions. It should be kept away from oxidants. 
Sodium hypochlorite, or otherwise known as the liquid chlorine bleach, is a strong oxidant, an eye irritant and corrosive to most metals. Never ever mix bleach with formaldehyde or diaminobenzidine. Sodium iodate may be used to replace mercuric oxide when reconstituting Harris hematoxylin. There is little risk when used in laboratory quantities. Sodium thiosulfate carries minimal health risk when used in histology under normal conditions. Solutions used to disincurize sections will contain significant amounts of mercury and should be discarded down the drain. Sulfuric acid, on the other hand, is a strong irritant to skin, eyes, and respiratory system. Dilute solutions pose no risk while concentrated acid produces fumes that are dangerous to health and require the use of fume hood, apron, goggles, and gloves. Sulfuric acid is corrosive to most metals. Silene and toluene class are both clearing agents. So toluene and silene are both a skin and eye irritant and is toxic by ingestion, inhalation, or skin contact. Repeated exposure can cause impaired memory, poor coordination, mood swings, and permanent nerve damage. Its use should be restricted or avoided if possible, except as a diluent in mounting media or for removing count, uh, cover slips. A gallon of silene, by the way, class, should be disposed as an EPA hazardous waste through a licensed waste howler. By, by the way, both of these, toluene and silene, are also clearing agents. Last but not the least is zinc chloride. This is corrosive to most metals, including stainless steel. It should not be used in tissue processors. It is a skin and eye irritant and can cause severe gastrointestinal problems if ingested. As a general rule, during the process of dilution, Concentrated acid should be added to water, so acids to water, in order to prevent splashing and should be done under a chemical fume hood. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have learned something new from me today. For any questions and inquiries, kindly post it in our histopathologic FB page and I will answer you from there. Thank you so much and have a great day.